any question here, feel free to drop question in the Q&A or in the chat. And otherwise, let's talk about canisters. So what does it mean to trust the canister? And why there are many, many, I would say, details that we don't talk about necessarily every day that we need to take into account, uh, which are specific to the IC in terms of the, the trust model. So the first thing to understand is that we have kind of two trust levels and trust issues. There could be trust issues with the ICP protocol. So even if the ICP protocol is considered trustworthy and um, there is a consensus and there is cryptography that makes it secure, of course, no system is 100% secure. So if you want to, you know, really dive into it and read the source code and understand how the ICP works, you will notice that it's really good technology, but it's not magic. And there are some security assumptions that are made. And so if the protocol breaks, then we don't have any assumption on the application layer because the application layer is built on top of the protocol layer. So it's like if the foundation cracks, then the rest also crack. And then there are the security assumption and the trust assumption at the canister level. So it's possible that one canister could get hacked or hijacked by developers without putting into any, any cause the, the protocol as a whole, but just because the application, the way it's coded, um, or there are some backdoors or specific issues with this application. So I'll start with the protocol. The protocol uses a consensus model uh, essentially, canisters are replicated across multiple nodes. And so if we go into the network tab, you can see subnets. Each canister is located in one subnet, and each subnet contains many, many nodes that replicates the canister. If you want to modify the state of the canister, you have to go through a consensus mechanism, which involves two-thirds of the nodes. And so... The security assumption is that if you want to break a subnet, you need at least um, one third plus of the nodes. So for example, if you have a subnet with 13 node machines, you will need four nodes that for yeah, four nodes that collude to essentially modify your canister. So now the first thing that we realize is that the security of a canister depends on the subnets we are located in. So for example, the subnets that are listed here would be less, we could say less secure and decentralized than the subnet that is located here, which is the NNS. So this is like the, the one of the most important subnet probably um, that has a count of 40 nodes machine. Then there is another factor to take into account is that in the case of GIC, the count, the count of the nodes is not the only factor that is taken into account to try to decentralize the network. There is something else which is called deterministic de decentralization. So the whole theory there behind that is that decentralization doesn't necessarily mean that the more node you have, the more decentralized it is. One argument is like, Let's say on Ethereum, you have, let's say, 1,000 nodes, but all of those nodes, like two thirds of those nodes are actually running on AWS. So how do you, how do you judge the decentralization? Whereas on the IC, each node provider is independent party. And also they try to make it that it's decentralized across multiple jurisdictions and multiple countries. So for example, here you can see some of them in Africa. Right now, I believe the South America region is the one that is lacking nodes the most. If we take a look at the, oops, if we take a look at the dashboard. Yeah, there are just boundary nodes. Uh, no, upcoming nodes here. But right now there is no, as you can see, no node in the, in the South America region and Africa is getting started, but we can see that it's quite delayed compared to, well, of course, if we look into US or Europe, Europe, I think is the one which 
is the most preeminent right now. Uh, Middle East as well is quite late. Asia is looking good. So yeah, uh, essentially the security of your application will depend on the subnet your application is deployed on, but you have access to the information and you can know which subnet your machine is running on. And you can also know what are the data centers your nodes, your application is running on. So here you can see if I am in this subnet, I can take a look. Those are all my location, all my data center owner and all the node providers. Um, yeah. Each person, each organization that had to go and like is now a node has been approved by the NNS, so approved by the DAO of the IC. And to be approved, you essentially have to make like a declaration, you have to prove your identity, and you also have to fill out a few documents. So essentially you are entering, you can think of nodes as kind of contractor for the DAO. They could be essentially, they could be essentially um, banned by the DAO in case something was wrong. I think today came up an interesting topic. So Definity released a new update, which was about, uh, it should be in, on Definity Dev. Uh, generally, I I would say Definity Dev is probably more interesting than the Definity Twitter account. This is the Twitter account specialized for developers. So if you want to, you know, get on the tech updates, this is the account to follow. And usually they release news that are, I think, for me, are more interesting. For example, the new node metric is coming. So now we have fully transparent, verifiable performances for each node, which is a big, I would say, step towards uh, implementing, again, a better consensus and a better node system. Because right now, there is no way to really punish the nodes if they are acting. Um, well, there are no ways to punish the node if they are acting in a non-performance manner. So if they are crashing a lot, if they are not available, uh, they are slowing down everyone else. And this new update will essentially enable that uh, at the at the DAO level, at the NNS level. Okay, so that's the first step, like that your subnet is safe and secure. Uh, and those concerns, I would say, are already at the protocol level. So it's getting better and better every time the protocol is being worked on. And so as long as the incentives to keep improving the protocol are there, the security of the subnets will keep improving. Uh, we haven't had any issue so far, so stay. I guess it's uh, it's a good sign. But again, let's be honest: no system is one hundred percent secure. If we really dive into it, so we will see what the future holds. Uh, second second consideration is your actual canister. So it's important to understand that every canister has. Oh, I can see there are some questions that I've missed. I have a question regarding my graduation project. Yes, we can talk about that. So Salvador Silva, feel free to send me a DM. You have my Discord or also on open chat and we can talk about that one-to-one. Uh, -one. Have there already been security issues with certain subnets? No, not at all. So there are a few things that we know. We know that Definity is monitoring at the moment, so monitoring the consensus. And since Genesis, there has never been an instance where one node has deviated from other in terms of consensus. So the malicious node like scenario, actually in practice, we haven't seen it so far. Um, and the second thing that we know is that there is almost a few billions stored on the IC in terms of total value. And that hasn't been hacked so far. So that's also like a kind of natural way to see that the protocol hasn't been hacked. Um, 
I stay cautious because even though I'm really excited about ICP and everything, I think like every system is as kind of failure and there is no magic. What I want to see, and I think what it's really interesting is the Bitcoin and Ethereum integration. Because if you think about it, if you are an ICP node provider, you don't want to hack ICPs. Like let's say you you hack the NNS and you store you stole ICPs to two people. <laughs> you manage to do that. It's going to be very hard, but you still manage to do that. Then everyone else knows that ICP has been hacked. And then you try to sell your ICPs and probably the price is going to crash. So it's not a good idea, I think. It's not something you want to do. But on the other side, when you have an integration with a network like Bitcoin or Ethereum, if there are Bitcoins that are stored on the IC, so that nodes can access in theory if they collude and everything, and same thing for Ethereum, then the game becomes different because the game is more about, I want to get those Bitcoin. And if you can access the Bitcoin and you hack ICP doing that, doing that I don't think Bitcoin as a as, as an asset and the price is not going to fluctuate because ICP has been hacked. It's probably maybe like one percent, not even one percent. Uh, so yeah, if there are an there is a huge incentive, there are like a few a few millions already. Um, but the future will tell us, and I think it's something that is taken very seriously. So uh, we will see in the future. I think honesty is going to be very hard to hack the IC just because of the way things are done because the nodes, they risk more than just, I mean, they are really putting their identity out there. Um, and also data centers are not something that you can easily like break into. And also there are a lot of protections at the protocol level. If you dive really into it, you will see like for example, uh, not shufflings is something that is coming. Um, secure enclaves, so nodes don't even have access to the code they are running. Actually, they cannot even like it's encrypted. It's also something that is coming, so it's going to be very hard and harder the time, the more time spent. But I think it's always going to be a balance between like how much the incentives are and how smart the protocol is. Uh, and I think the protocol still has a long way to go before be becoming like unhackable. So I talk a lot. <laughs> I hope it's still something you can follow. Is there any way to specify where your canister gets run? Not at the moment. Uh, well, I need to verify that. It was not the case a few months ago. Not at the moment. The only thing that is for sure is that if you deploy a canister and with a canister, you can actually create new canisters. Uh, from from one canister, you can use it like to generate instances of canisters. They are going to be in the same subnet. So the original canister that you deploy, every baby canister will be in the same subnet, just because it reduces latencies. But um, otherwise, I don't think there is a way to choose right now. And you cannot move your canister to a new subnet, but this is something that is being worked on and should come up pretty soon. Now, what I wanted to show you is the security assumption at the canister level. So, Not every canister deployed on the IC is trustworthy. And this is a warning for every one of you. Be careful with applications on the IC. Um, well, in general, be, be careful with crypto and like what you do with your assets and money. Uh, this is all very speculative and like new. So there are a lot of hacks. We know that. And there are a lot of uh, problems and everything. But on the IC, there are a few more things to consider, especially for DeFi and NFT. A smart contract, when it's deployed, it's by default immutable. So when you deploy on Ethereum, no one can 
you know, no one can change the smart contract once it's out there. And you have also access to all the source code. A canister works differently. A canister, you don't have necessarily access to the source code. You have access to the interface most of the time, but you don't have access to the code. So a canister to be considered trustworthy needs to follow, I would say, three, three criteria. The first one is that no, if there is a controller, the controller is a DAO and the DAO is sufficiently decentralized to not be able to pass proposal and modify the code. Because as we've seen before, a canister can be can have multiple controllers and a canister controller can change the code at any point in time. So if you have assets in the canister, you can your your assets as are secure as secure as the person that is controlling the canister is trustworthy, essentially. For example, on the Motoko Bootcamp dashboard, right now I have full control. Uh, there is not a lot that, you know, there, there is no token and everything, so it's totally fine. But if there was a token or if it was like a marketplace, any asset that you would send, essentially, I would be able to take control of it. Then if there is no controller, uh, it's going to be super secure because no one can ever upgrade the code, but also it makes it kind of... Uh, sad because the application can never be upgraded, you know? So the usual way to go and most applications that are deployed on DIC, the, the, the common way that they, they run and work is uh, through a DAO governed canister. So only the DAO can upgrade through a transparent proposal, the code of the canister. And in that scenario, you also have to consider that not, not all DAOs are done equal. You know that uh, we know that we have a lot of um, insiders. We have a lot of DAOs that claim to be decentralized when actually you have just a few people that could pass votes if they collude. So you have to take all of this into account and you have to know what you're getting into. Generally, I'm pretty confident because honestly, for the amount of money that is out there, uh, and the time that I have spent in the community, I have never encountered a scam yet. Um, most of the time, what I feel trust, what I feel can be trusted is when I see like a team that is out there uh, publicly, you know, they are public, they are kind of doxxed. Um, so they won't necessarily have incentive to scam their community. But keep in mind that projects are in development and most of the time, the end goal is to be decentralized and never be able to upgrade the project and everything. But there is always this middle transitionary period where actually in reality, most teams have control over their infrastructure. So it has been uh, no incident so far, but you have to know what you're getting into, especially if you're investing money. And the second thing is that even if the, there is no controller, how do you know the code that is running in the canister? So to do that, to essentially know and to be sure, you have to take a look at the module hash. So the module hash is a SHA-256. So SHA-256. I'm hoping that most of you are familiar with it. If not, don't worry, it's a hash method. Essentially, you give an input, any data, and it gives you um, a, a, like a, a list of characters and string. And if you have the same data in the input, you have the same output. But if you change the data slightly, even just a little bit, then you have a completely different output. So essentially, what we do is that we have this module that is certified by DIC. So your WebAssembly module outputs publicly the SHA-256 and you have this and then you have the source code that is published hopefully on like open source repository. You can take this, compile the WebAssembly module on your side and if it corresponds to the module that you see, like the hash that you see on the IC, then you know that the code that is out there is the code that the developers claim to have written. Uh, and we could do actually a, a verification session So you can see it's um, 
it's quite, you know, it's not that easy to trust a canister. And actually, I think we need to work on that. We need to have more tools. Like, for example, one thing I would like to to have for user would maybe like, I guess, in the end, like if we look really long term, I think those issues will naturally disappear as we get more skilled and we have more security and more trust and everything. But in a temporary period, I think it's great to, would, to have maybe like an extension that would tell users if they are interacting with canisters and who is controlling those canisters and like essentially helping people take decisions. Um, this is something that I've been thinking about building, but not enough time. And that would be super helpful, yeah, to to get those information. How would we know this? How can we check out who this controller are if they are a DAO or not? Yes, good question. So you, the only information that you have is um, the IDs. So those IDs are the principal ID. Generally, if you see short principal ID, this means that this is a canister, this is a canister. And this, it means that it's a DFX principle. So this one, you know that it's gonna be like a human. This one, you know that it's gonna be a canister, but you don't know what canister. And this one, you know that it's gonna be a canister. So usually what you could do is take a look at it and, you know, take a look. And then if you see like, this is, okay, this is controlled by then humans, you know that it's not a DAO. Um, Let's take a look at the SNSs. So the good thing about SNSs is that it's taking into account those considerations and essentially proposing a framework to build DAOs and secure application. If we look at OpenShot, if we look at those canisters, we can see that this controller is the OpenShot root um, so the roots, like we would need to look deep into how the SNS framework works. That could be actually a good video to make or a good uh, tutorial how the SNS works. But essentially there is a governance canister and a root canister. The root canister is just a backup in case the governance goes down. But as you can see here, it's only canister that, you know, only canisters that controls canisters. So it seemed to look like a DAO and there is not a human that could change those canisters from just one day to another. Uh, but then after that, I guess it's like more research and you have to dive into the IDs, look at what, what each ID does. Um, Open chat gives us a good reference because they have their GitHub repository and they have this concept where you can verify the, the WASM by yourself. So you can run and build the OpenShot canisters WASM by running these commands, these uh, scripts, and then you can check if it's comparing to the WASM that is on the IC. So was, this is a verification that we could do. Uh, this takes some time. I tried to do it last time and it took me like a few a few hours. I don't know if I did something wrong, but it was super long. But essentially, this is something that anyone could verify, assuming they have the correct setup. And that concludes my talk about Canister. Then there is the, the whole issues on security, but I won't dive too much into it. Um, if you are interested, at Code and State, we are doing audits for the internet computer. So we have uh, Solid State, which is uh, the first and actually only ICP focus code audits agency. We have done two audits for two DeFi applications. So the first one was Sonic and the second one was IC Lighthouse, IC Lighthouse, which just came out a few days ago. And if you want to take a look, the all the audits that we've done, if we look at the GitHub, uh, is it on GitHub? I guess it was. So 
so right now we are basically in the first like in the first uh, few moments of a kind of new industry because auditing canister is very different from auditing smart contracts they are much more like they are much different considerations like everything that i've talked about today for example the fact that we can upgrade the code the fact that the code is asynchronous where on ethereum it's synchronous there are a lot of new considerations that take into account that you have to take into account if you have a multi canister application then it gets even more complex like how those canisters communicate with each other so we are basically building kind of a new sub industry i would say inside cybersecurity and so the way that we've decided to go is to publish all the audits of solid states and to essentially create education and materials on security on the IC. Uh, we have the luck to have on our team the creator of the NNS. So actually a next definitely employee that was the lead software developer for the NNS and SNS. So he knows what he's talking about and he's doing the, the lead for the the audits that we perform. And if you want to take a look at what an audit of an ICP application looks like, then you have this audit, which is quite, yeah, like quite long. Um, and it it goes into detail. It's the Sonic swap. Can you audit non-open source code? And what kind of thing do you look for in an audit? Yes, you we look into non-open source code, though if you go for SNS, you will need to open source your code. And what kind of thing do you look for in an audit? Uh, we can go very deep, but it depends also on what you need. Like for example, for IC Lighthouse, we haven't done the, um, the whole infrastructure because they wanted us to focus on the DeFi side of things. I know that they are launching like an NFT collection which is related to their project, but it's not core to it. So they actually, we focus on the DeFi side, just like look at how the collection interacted with the rest, but not audited the, the um, NFT collection. Primarily what we look at is all sort of like asynchronous issues. So the most common issues that we see on the IC is this asynchronous pattern where you can have like a, a state changes between two calls and you don't necessarily take into account that into account. Um, and then, I mean, general vulnerabilities, we do Motoko and Rust. So no vulnerabilities in like libraries or Motoko code that you could use. We also do, yeah, you can see actually, if you look at these audits, you could actually look at everything that they've looked into. I'm not the one that is uh, doing the audit. So I have actually done an audit in one, one audit in my life, but I was not like professional and I was just there to support and like um, give a look at the code. So I, I don't know much about audits. I'm just, uh, I just like to, you know, hack a few applications around and look at the, the things, but I'm not a professional audit. So if you want to more information, uh, definitely look at, at it and I can also put you in touch with the team. If you are running a canister on a subnet and that subnet fails, what happens to your running canister? Depends on what you mean by fail. So if it fails, like if the subnet crashes, like let's say half of the node crashes, then your canister won't be responsive anymore. Like you won't be able to process message. You will still be able to look into it, to do query. But it should resume the operation as long as 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 soon as the subnet is back. And actually, it can go very fast because the NNS would actually reallocate nodes to your subnet to kind of fix the problems of the nodes that have crashed. The only case where you could lose a canister is if all the nodes in your subnet would go down and never go back up again. So that would be very unlikely. But it, yeah, it's it's a possibility, but it would be very unlikely that all of them go down at the same moment.
And that's about it for the how to trust the canister session. I hope you liked it. Hope you've learned a lot today. We have uh, still 20 minutes. So if you want to ask me any question about other topics and we have this mentorship session, so feel free to do it. Some of these big meme coins, uh, well, could you give me a name? Let's take a look at those meme coins. Big. Uh, yeah, alors, so I'm not following too much the meme coins, but let's take a look. Okay, so WinDodge98. Let's take a look at the canister ID. Yeah, so I can tell you that they are controlled right now. Uh, so there is a controller here. So I would need to look more closely into who are those principles. Let's say, so does this one. It's probably a DFX identity. Okay. No. Yes, so my theory is that this is a cycle wallet. So the cycle wallet is the wallet that contains the cycles when you deploy your canisters. And so when you deploy a canister, both your DFX identity and your cycle wallets are going to be controller of the canister. So, and also your DFX identity is controller of your cycle wallet. So here, if you follow my theory, like this is the cycle wallet and the controller is the DFX principle. So the principle of the developer here and yeah, it follows the theory, like because you can find it here as well. Now it should be, maybe it's probably a second, oops, it's a second uh, cycle wallet, probably. Oh, there is no controller here. Okay, this is interesting because this is a black hole canister, so let me see. So this canister is interesting. Uh, the black hole, the black hole canister is uh, essentially a way to set a canister as immutable. And the black hole canister is a canister that actually has no controller. And so you can set your canister controller to this canister. Because this canister has no controller, then your canister is essentially black hole. Why, now the question is, why would you like to, to add this canister and not just remove all controller? Because when you remove all controller, you lose access to canister status, which gives you like information about the um, canister status, like remaining cycles, module hash, um, no, this is not. No, remaining cycles and module hash are public, but not inf not all information are public about canisters. For example, um, the you know when we do like uh, 
Uh, how am I going to do that? Yes, so the FX canister status gives you all those information about your canister, but only the controller can call the canister status. So essentially the black hole, where is my canister? It's here. The black hole canister acts as a proxy, which you can use to essentially make your canister immutable, but still have access to canister status. You just forward the call to the black hole through the black hole canister. Uh, and this is how you would give your canister to a black hole. And essentially, if you do that and you remove all other controllers, then your canister is not mutable anymore. What is surprising here is that you have... So... You have the black hole canister, it seems like, but also other canisters, so like other controllers. Uh, let me go back here. So, yeah, I cannot, I think this canister can be upgraded by someone. I mean, I'm pretty sure about it. And yeah, it's not great. Uh, it should be, if it's controlled by a DAO, it's already more trustworthy, but currently it's controlled by one developer. So this is not really trustworthy. I would not put too much into those meme tokens. Of course, they could still go up. It doesn't mean that uh, the, the developer is not going to remove themselves at some point, but it's more of a trust game now. Yeah, very interesting analysis. Yeah, we could even go in a bit deeper, I guess, if we really had more time to go into those identities, but um, yeah. So I guess this is the open chat group for them. It looks pretty cool otherwise. <laughs> yeah, it looks pretty cool otherwise. Uh, okay, uh, let's close this session here and take some 10 minute breaks before our next session. Our next session, I'm excited because we will be with ICPCC, which is the community conference that we are uh, launching. So I think our website is not here yet. Here. So we will talk about ICPCC, which is the next ICP community conference starting on May 10, 2024. It's going to be a global conference with many meetups around the world, possibility for you to get involved. Uh, but I will let the Ricardo, which is the one working on it, talk about it. And uh, yeah, see everyone in 20, 10 minutes. <laughs>